So next we have the uh, Abdul Salam lecture by Professor Vijay Raghavan. And uh, I would like to request Penta to uh, actually introduce him. Uh, but before that, we have a small uh, token uh, for Professor Vijay Raghavan. So please. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, so uh, the ICTS Abdul Salam uh, series uh, was uh, initiated to honor the memory of uh, Professor Abdul Salam, who is a very well-known uh, particle physicist. But uh, more than that, actually, he is the person who started the International Center for Theoretical Sciences, Theoretical Physics in Trieste, which, in a sense, uh, has been a in, in some sense did uh, inspire, in part, uh, the setting up of this type of center. Now, the ICTP in Trieste has uh, helped uh, the, at least uh, many groups in India very much, especially the string theory group in the Tata Institute in Mumbai uh, during the early years. Uh, and so we decided actually this center should commemorate his memory by this type of named lecture. Now we are very uh, happy uh, and honored to have uh, Professor K. Vijay Raghavan to give the third Abdul Salam Memorial Lecture. Uh, Vijay Raghavan, I, I think I first saw Vijay Raghavan on the balcony of uh, Hall 5 in IIT Kanpur, where I used to also live. <laughs> okay, but since then... I hope you don't go on that thread anymore. No, no, I won't, I won't, I won't. I just hinted at that. <laughs> okay, so he uh, is a very distinguished biologist, a distinguished professor at the Tata Institute and uh, former director of the National Center for Biological Sciences of TIFR uh, in uh, the ascent of the NCBS uh, in no mean measure uh, can be attributed to the tireless efforts of uh, Vijay Raghavan. He is presently Secretary of the Department of Biotechnology of the Government of India. And uh, <clears throat> his education-wise, uh, he was, as I said, from IIT Kanpur. He's a chemical engineer by training and uh, got his uh, master's and PhD in molecular biology from the Tata Institute and spent uh, time after that at the California Institute of Technology before uh, returning to the TIFR. So Vijaya Kavan's contributions in science in the fields of development biology, developmental biology, genetics, and neurogenetics have been widely recognized. His research primarily focuses on the important principles and mechanisms that control nervous system and muscles during development and how these neuromuscular systems direct specific locomotor behaviors. Vijay is a fellow of the Indian Academy of Science, the Indian National Science Academy, the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS, the Royal Society of London, and Foreign Associate of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He received the Distinguished Alumnus Award of IIT Kanpur, uh, the S.S. Patnagar Award, the J.C. Bose Fellowship, and the inaugural Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2009, and the Padma Shri in 2013. Very happy to say that Vijay has been with the ICTS from day one. In fact, uh, the council meeting that uh, approved the ICTS uh, in TIFR, Vijay and I were sitting next to each other, actually. For some reason, both of us were called for that meeting. He is on the management board of the ICTS and on the board of governors of Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and also on the scientific advisory board of IFOM in Milan in Italy. So with these few words of introduction, I'd like to invite uh, Vijay to deliver his talk. I don't think I need that. 
I don't need that. Uh, yeah, that'll be nice. Oh, thank you very much, Spenta, for that uh, introduction. Uh, a bit excessive, if I may say so, <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here again. I was here, I think, in June, and as David mentioned, it's pretty amazing to see um, you know, the transformation if you visit every few months, um, and it's, it's really impressive. Uh, actually, at that time, I mentioned, and I'd like to say again, uh, when I was in Trieste many years ago, I saw a big construction site uh, at which there was a sign which quoted Winston Churchill, uh, which said that uh, we make our buildings and then they make us. And I think that's absolutely true. I think this campus will really, you know, feed back on quality, uh, the way it's built, and will really allow excellent science to take place. Um, it's also really... Um, an honor to be asked to give the Abdus Salam lecture, particularly because as a consequence of uh, Obeid Siddiqui's interactions earlier on with the ICTP, uh, several of us actually started a biology course, a neurobiology course in, at ICTP given every other year many years ago. And we had a tremendous time uh, teaching uh, and learning from students from all over the world. Um, the ICTP is, of course, many of you have been there, is extraordinarily impressive. You can see this here, the castle by the uh, sea at Miramar. And um, it really brings together um, talented people from all over the world uh, who try to solve difficult problems. And here are a set of people trying to solve how to get into Emerson Narsimhan's apartment. Uh, <laughs> That's Michael Bade there, top neuroscientist, uh, who's about whose work I'll talk about a little bit. Jim Truman next to him, Raul Pandit and Matthew, and they really try to figure out what numbers to press to ring the bell at Narsimhan's apartment. Um, Trieste also um, was a place where Mike Bate and Veronica, seen here with James Joyce, um, they headed the team with Matthew and others on a neurobiology course. And that course, as you can see from this sign here, brought together students from China, Iran, Iraq, uh, working with teaching assistants from Bangalore. Rudra Das is a student at NC was just finished. So is Mustafa Zurrahman. But it was really terrific to see, and Farana. Um, so it's terrific to see how much interaction took place at this wonderful location. And the challenge at that course, as we have today, is, uh, was a simple one, um, which is to try and understand how the brain is made to function. And this uh, is a challenge because quite often animals do amazing things uh, soon after they're born in an environment which they haven't actually experienced during their development in the womb or you know, in the embryo or wherever. For example, a mountain goat, soon after it's born, can scamper up steep slopes. A fruit fly can fly without going to training school. Uh, how does it manage that? How, how are these abilities put together as the animal develops? In addition to asking how brains in general develop, we like to think that our brain is somewhat special, that we have the ability, we are conscious, we are sentient beings, and, and we somehow are different from other animals which, with nervous systems and brains. And is that really so? Uh, our brains are extraordinary, and uh, they, we indeed have done extraordinary things. For example, um, 10,000 years ago, humans and their livestock constituted uh, something like 0.1% of vertebrate biomass. Today, humans and our livestock and pets constitute about 98% of uh, 
vertebrate biomass. So we have not only uh, learned to survive in this world, today we are the agents of change in this world, and in no small measure because of our brain connected to our motor system, uh, and therefore cultural evolution as a consequence and creation of new motor systems which have transformed this planet. So not only do we need to understand how the brain is made, we might have a slight responsibility uh, for the rest of the planet uh, in, in dealing with its future. And there are different parts of the brain which perform specific functions. You have the visual cortex, the motor cortex, and so on. So the brain is reg regionally specialized in multiple ways. And we'd like to think that this large specialization which is there is unique to us, and indeed it seems to be behaviorally, and not a property of uh, which other animals share. And we'd like to think, because of the large size of the human brain proportionate to our body size, that big is good, big is better. But that doesn't seem to be the case, and Suzanne Herculana Husel, a Brazilian neuroscientist, decided to examine this question. And she found that, which was already known actually, she, uh, she, I'll tell you what she found, but it was known that, for example, the elephant brain, the African elephant's brain, is slightly larger than our brain, yet we wouldn't give the African elephant uh, capabilities in many ways which our brain has. Even more interesting, certain large rodents, for example, the capybara shown at the bottom left, has a very large brain and yet has fewer neurons than, let's say, a capuchin monkey, and the, which can do all sorts of different things. It's got much higher cognitive ability, we would think, than the rodent. So, what, um, uh, yeah, sorry, what Herculano Hosel, I was just trying to get her name, she asked is, how many neurons are there in a human brain? And typically, when this question was asked, uh, and for many, many years, I've known biologists throw out random figures, a trillion neurons, a hundred billion neurons, you know, 50 billion neurons, and so on and so forth. And she found that the experiment to find out how many neurons there were actually had not been done. And she devised a beautiful method by which she got these numbers, by the way, of the numbers of neurons in different animals. She devised a beautiful method to actually count the number of neurons. What she did was to take brains or parts of brains and dissolve away the membranes with soap and then leave the nuclei of neurons and other cells intact and put them in a soup, played that soup out, and count different regions, how many nuclei there were, and extrapolate to the total number of neurons. And this resulted in these kinds of numbers, but it also resulted in numbers for human, which are shown here. And humans, by this count, have something like 86 billion neurons, compared to a macaque monkey, which has something like 6,376 million neurons, uh, and, you know, for example, a capuchin monkey, 36 billion, uh, and so on and so forth. What she also found, that when you look at how neuronal numbers scale, as opposed to brain size scaling, you find that humans are primates, they are primates, of course, but their brain size and the numbers of neurons, numbers of neurons in the brain, sorry, not brain size, scales in a primate-like manner and not, for example, of course, in a rodent-like manner. For example, in rodents, you have brain size increasing rapidly, but it increases because of the size of neurons, not because of numbers of neurons. In other words, humans are special because of a very large number of neurons and not because of brain size. And this large number of neurons requires a huge amount of energy, and she argues that in evolutionary time, when we had Homo sapiens coming up from Homo erectus, Australopithecus, and so on and so forth. That coincided with the time when cooking came about, and other large primates have to spend the entire day eating to feed their nervous system and body. But humans, or pre-humans, accidentally discovered cooking and therefore could get nutrition much more easily packed in a smaller time, allowing brain expansion to, to sort of go together with this uh, discovery. 
And this resulted in unusually large number of neurons, and therefore much of our cognitive ability and so on follows there. And indeed, she also quantified and, sh and showed that in terms of cortical neurons, where all these higher functions supposedly take place, both in terms of percentage of brain mass and in terms of percentage of brain neurons, primates actually have a higher number. And, and we, we fall uh, higher in that category. So in that situation, we now have a task to understand how does this come about? How do you make large numbers of neurons? How do you specialize different regions, cortex, uh, other parts, special parts of the cortex, other regions of the brain, the motor system, and so on and so forth? To do this, and we actually have learned a huge amount, we need to understand evolution by natural selection. We need to understand genetics. We need to understand embryology, and we need to understand molecular biology, right? Bringing all this together allows us to actually understand how the brain is made. We need to understand evolution because all life on this planet has a common origin, and this wall at t is equal to zero where life originated is populated hugely by unicellular organisms of huge complexity, and multicellular organisms have evolved over time. And as Dobzhansky said, given enough time, uh, the unlikely will happen, and indeed lots of unlikely events have happened given the early chemistry. That early chemistry is shared through DNA. That early chemistry mutates to give rise to different life forms, different species, and variation within the species. And understanding this allows us to actually understand how nature's engineering has taken place. But recently, something else has also happened. In addition to our understanding of nature's engineering, there's been an incredible ability over the last couple of decades, um, an in increasing ability for us to actually manipulate uh, genes in multiple organisms, and therefore we can actually engineer nature in a manner which we never could do before. And there's been extraordinary technological developments in observing cellular function and actually seeing what happens when we do that and in normal situations. And therefore, our ability to understand what goes on inside an animal, inside a plant, is enormous. And therefore, the hypotheses, the ideas of Darwin and Mendel are now actually testable and provable and examinable in a developmental context in an organism. So let's first look at evolution. What we know and you've seen that in those diagrams of brains for multiple animals, is that evolution, speciation takes place by natural selection in different environmental contexts. But Darwin did not know what happens inside the organism to result in this, and he indeed had very strange ideas about how that happens. He, interestingly, in his garden, actually looked at variation within a species and looked at how mating between two different, within a, a species of plant could take place and how tolerance and intolerance and mating uh, took place uh, in this plant. And he had actually very carefully calculated all the numbers of progeny and when this was allowed. And this would have allowed him to predict Mendel's laws, but he didn't do that. He was a big data person and not a small data person and he missed the small data by looking at the big data, but he made enormous discoveries in big data. Mendel, on the other hand, and um, by the way, the story about Darwin having missed the data is apparently in the Mendel Museum in Bruno. There is a copy of the origin of species, and Mendel has noted in the margin that I'm amazed at how this man missed seeing uh, this, this distribution of numbers. Now, I need to go to that museum to actually see this, and I've heard this from a friend of mine, but that'll be quite impressive if Darwin actually missed seeing both um, you know, um, Mendel's laws uh, as well as having found his own. So Mendel's laws tell us how variation takes place from generation to generation, and it doesn't look at how speciation takes place, and there was for a long time a war between Darwin and Mendel's followers about whether the mechanisms could be similar or not. And this war could have been resolved much, much earlier if only people across different disciplines spoke to each other and they didn't speak for quite a while. But the understanding of DNA as a genetic material and the later discovery of the structure of DNA 
allowed an understanding that it's nucleic acid, which is the thread which ties all life on this planet, and it's changes in nucleic acid which gives rise to variation from generation to generation. So with Darwin and Wallace and Mendel, and then with Watson, Crick, and others, we have an understanding of how all life on this planet has evolved and how variation from generation to generation takes place. It's absolutely astounding, and these are no longer theories, but these are actually experimentally verifiable because of our understanding of molecular mechanisms. How then does, given this situation, from a fertilized egg, an animal develop? And that is a problem which another set of people who actually didn't communicate too much with these sets were studying. And these were embryologists trying to understand, typically with using amphibians, how an embryo divided to a fertilized egg divided to give rise to two cells, four cells, and so on, and how these cells became different to give rise to an organism. And the experiments they did typically involved taking a hot needle and killing a few cells and asking which part of the organism disappeared when you did that. And sometimes they took cells from one part and put it in another part of the developing embryo. Or sometimes they took cells from one part and put it in another part of a developing embryo in another organism, having marked these donor cells and the host cells so they could see what the host cells, uh, the donor cells did in its new context. Typically, when you do these kinds of experiments, when you take cells from one region and put them in another and another organism, they behave as if they were from this place, that's the guess, or they would be influenced by that context and behave as if they were in that place. But Hilda Mangold, who was a young technician and later a student of Hans Spiemann, she and Hans Spiemann did an experiment in which they took these marked cells and put them in another place in a tadpole. And that experiment resulted in an astounding discovery. Uh, what happened was those cells in that location actually transformed the entire region. So the entire region behaved as if it were in this large region where these cells originally were. So these cells had an organizing capability far beyond the small number. And this was called, later on, the Spiemann organizer. And that's Hans Spiemann there, and that's Hilda Mangold. And here's Eddie D. Robertus of the University of California at Los Angeles repeating this experiment. He takes, with extraordinarily sophisticated instruments, you can see, a little bit of a frog embryo out. That's a you know, blunt needle and blunt forceps. He tears it out. And then he will stick it in into the other embryo there, uh, where he opens up a place and taps it in. I think he's doing that now. Yeah, there he goes. He's tapping it in. So in that location now, he takes it from here and puts it over there. Then he goes home, and then he comes back the next day. And amazingly, you see an embryo with two axes, right? And this is astounding. And this is, is really very stunning, because it says that these cells have some capability. And people then started looking all over the place for where this capability to construct an organism lies. And is it inside the cell? Is it in the nucleus where there's DNA? Is it in the cytoplasm? Is it in the membrane? Uh, and so on and so forth. And that was a long um, you know, quest. And for example, here is just a black American who left America for Europe. And he claimed that it is the membrane of the cell which is, has this information. And he came back for a fresh trip for his professor and says in six months in Europe, he found more collegiality than he ever found in America. Goldschmidt, who emigrated from Europe to Berkeley, uh, said it was the nucleus of the cell which was important. And he said in six months in America, he found more collegiality than he ever found in Europe. <laughs> so it was also a time when political turmoil and debates, as now, as always, impacted on science, and different views about how animals were made came up. But the solution, or rather what we know so far, is interesting, and that has come about by a combination 
of extraordinary successes in molecular biology, our ability to sequence genes, manipulate genes, put them back in another organism to see whether they rescue defects or not, put them back in new concepts so you can put back genes in new contexts, express them in new contexts rather than put groups of cells and so on. These sophisticated experiments in a variety of organisms from plants to moss to bacteria and yeast and flies and worms uh, and so on, fish, have resulted in an extraordinary understanding, albeit descriptive largely, uh, mechanistically substantially in substantial parts but not enough, about how from a fertilized egg you can make an animal. And here is a human embryo on the left, uh, a human egg on the left, and a human embryo on the right. And the way you make an embryo from a fertilized egg is, I'll give you a simple partly correct approximation. You divide so that you have a sheet of cells. And you take that sheet of cells and you partition those, that sheet of cells, of identical cells, into different parts, head, trunk, abdomen, tail, and so on. Give them molecular properties because of the action of genes which regulate specific genes and therefore in one part you turn on head specific genes, trunk specific genes, abdomen specific genes and so on. This is long before these structures have actually differentiated. Then you take the sheet of cells and you convert it into a tube. And with the tube you have a mouth and a rear end and that basically is what a primitive animal is about. You topologically have a situation where food can come in and stuff can go out and these groups of cells are there in, in a tube and you do that by actually folding inwards and making this tube. Now along each of these parts, head, abdomen, uh, head, trunk, abdomen and so on and so forth, all these cells in different layers in this tube which you have made, you give them in each segment specific properties. You say this part shall become muscle, this the nervous system, this the gut, this the liver, this, in this segment you'll make appendages and so on. And these are not just descriptive properties which we have seen, there are very simple molecular ways by which this happens and typically they involve what are called transcription factors, genes which turn on other genes and these genes which turn on other genes are turned on or switched off because uh, by the following methods. Either cells remember who their parents are and therefore they take on different properties. They are related to different cells by lineage and because of that lineage they continue to have those properties. So liver precursor cells will generate liver cells forever and therefore will make only liver cells. So there's a lineage dependent commitment in development. This is I've, I've, I don't know how many of you have heard my developmental biology lecture, so those who have will forgive me, but this is called the English model where your function in society depends on your parents. The other, the, the other way by which cells become different from each other is they depend on their neighborhood. Those cells which were transformed, uh, transplanted over there influenced other cells and therefore that new, that neighborhood was influenced by what happens over there. And this is called uh, the American model where your, your place in society depends on where you live. And, and you can move around and manage that. There's another model which happens where you have a sheet of cells and randomly one becomes different and that then uses these other two methods, its progeny will be different and so on and so forth. But this random selection of one gene, uh, one cell to be different and the suppression by this of other cells to become like it uh, is a third mechanism and that's called the Indian mechanism. So I'm a government employee, I shouldn't be saying these things now. <laughs> but anyway, but these kinds of mechanisms result in the specialization of different tissues at different times and they are used again and again and in fact the same molecules are used again and again. The toolkit to make diverse tissues is essentially the same whether you are a small aircraft or a, a big jet fighter, you just have to know what to turn on where and what to switch off where. And the question then comes, how does one know what to do where and when? And I'll come to that. But basically, 
the same kinds of mechanisms which you use to make a liver or a gut or heart, so-called simple tissues, are exactly the same as what you would use to make a brain. Right? These same five sets of signaling pathways, typically, are necessary to make the brain. You know, you tell cells to divide, you regionally specialize them using these tools, these kits, and they interact with each other and so on and so forth. For example, let's take a sheet of cells, and let's say this auditorium is a sheet of cells. What you do is, by lineage, before you put in place all these chairs, you had a small number of chairs, and you say, this chair is different from this. So this chair and its progeny make that side, this, side, this chair and its progeny make this side. So these are separated by lineage. Now, supposing this side makes a signaling molecule which influences its neighbors, and it could make a short-range signaling molecule which influences only the adjacent rows. As a consequence of receiving that signal, that row now makes a long-range signaling molecule which can act on both sides in, let's say, a graded manner. And these models have been around for a while and some of them are being challenged. But basically, depending on the concentration of some molecule, different molecules, different parts, different chairs become different. So these kinds of mechanisms are reiterated again and again, but the output end is very different depending on context. As changes take place, the, the opportunity for different contexts are limited and you get a diversity of cell types. And from a descriptive sense, we know quite a lot of that. And interestingly today, with new technology, from a quantitative sense, we know a really, really lot. We know, for example, in any given single cell, what are the genes coming out, uh, being expressed, and what are the thousands of molecules which um, are being turned on, the RNA molecules and the proteins and so on and so forth. So we have an enormous amount of data coming in about this diversity. Now there's a view that with this data, one can understand anything in the brain. If you only knew where each and every cell was, what, when it was made, how it was made in terms of expression patterns of genes, and how it functioned physiologically by, let's say, magnetic resonance imaging, when you, know, you show it something or the other, you can actually understand how the brain works. And this view is being held by several people who do big data science. And others have the view that you don't need data, you just need penetrating ideas to solve this problem. And of course, as always, both of them are right and both of them are wrong. Let me digress for a bit and talk a bit about uh, this man. Now, what Alan Turing did for biology is awesome. He had ideas about pattern formation and development, and that's something which that is, it's a very contentious topic, very interesting, a lot of people are looking at that. He also, as you all know, devised ways by which we could find out if any of you were actually a computer in disguise. But he also invented the Turing machine. And another person in exile during the Second World War, Irving Schrodinger, looked at the Turing machine and combined that with what John von Neumann had invented, which is a computer which could replicate itself. And what von Neumann also suggested was, if there are defects in this replication, you could effectively get something uh, like mutations. So Turing invented the stored program computer, and von Neumann showed that the description is separate from this universal construct. And that's an important distinction which he made. But Schrodinger, in his book, What is Life, which had enormous influence, didn't, and this is you know, you know, an analysis done by Sidney Brenner, Schrodinger didn't make this distinction. He called chromosomes, where DNA is present, as architects plan and builders craft in one. This is wrong. The code script contains only a description of the executive function. It's not the executive function itself. So when we look at big data and biology, and we look at gene expression, when we look at gene regulation, the assumption that somehow in genes and the way they are regulated lies the entire executive function for building a brain is 
not only probably very, very likely uh, flawed. Given that, how does one understand the brain? Right? What is the right level of abstraction for understanding the brain? Indeed, life itself. And Brenner says that to understand the constructor part of the machinery, the cell is the right level of abstraction. And when you do that, then many things fall in place. Genes make RNA make proteins, and this is all used to construct a cell, but there's a cellular context which feeds back into gene expression, and therefore understanding how the cell is made and how the cell functions and how cells interact with each other is vital for understanding biology, because biology Unlike many sciences, you can't escape into holistic uh, constructs, neglecting the molecular part, the DNA, and neglecting the big scale. Biology is fantastic in the way it connects the smallest of scales to the largest uh, almost instantly. And that really is a challenge. How can we understand how the brain is made, meaning how can we understand how brain cells are made, and how they actually connect to each other. So, we need to get into the cell biology of how the brain is made. And that again turns out to have been done beautifully over the last few decades by hundreds of laboratories in a manner which tells us how one can make a large number of neurons which you saw constitute the human brain and the brain of other large animals. You start off, as I said in the early embryo, by a sheet of cells. And by this mechanism by which you make one cell special, repressing the other cells, and we know quite a bit about how that happens, you choose this cell which is called a neuroblast. And this neuroblast is a cell, a neural stem cell, whose progeny will make neurons. And because it is a stem cell, it has the property of self-renewal. It makes itself, and it makes another kind of cell. And this is called asymmetric division. So you can make a neural stem cell making itself and another cell, which will divide to get two neurons. So this keeps happening and you make more and more neurons. And depending on whether you're head, trunk, or abdomen, you make different kinds of neurons because you know that identity. If you want to make a huge number of neurons in the brain, instead of dividing in this asymmetric manner, where you have a stem cell making itself and two neurons, you have the stem cell making two stem cells, four stem cells, eight stem cells, and so on, making a large number of stem cells, and then making a large number of neurons. That's all very well. It's not just making neurons. It's also making neurons in the right place along the animal. But interestingly, and this is the important take-home message, stem cells and their progeny related by lineage in modules are also functional units. And this greatly simplifies our understanding of the very large number of neurons in the brain. You have a large number of parallel computers connected to each other, which is more understandable than billions of neurons which are born in all sorts of ways and connected to each other. Now, one of the pioneers of our understanding of neural stem cells is Chris Doe. He works on the fruit fly. He's earlier worked on the locust. And he was actually inspired that lab was inspired by a lot of pioneering work done by Michael Bate, whose photograph you saw trying to enter Narsimhan's house. And this in green is shown a stem cell dividing, and that will divide to give rise to a cell in red, and that cell will divide twice to give rise to two neurons. And this will keep happening as shown in this slide over here. So you have a neuroblast giving rise to another neuroblast and two neurons, another neuroblast and two neurons, and therefore there is not just a lineage, but there's also a hemilineage, which you can see. And if you look at this neural stem cell and its progeny, you'll see a wonderful grape-like structure shown over there. That big cell is the neural stem cell, and these other cells are their progeny. And both along the axis of the animal, at different layers on a given point in the axis, and with time, because of the regulated expression of a combinatorial code of transcription factors, molecules which turn on other genes, what happens is, over time, different 
cells take on different properties. So each and every neuron, for example, which is born from this lineage is different because it expresses a specific set of factors in a context dependent manner, making it either a neuron which will go over there, over there, or over there, but the entire bunch will have one kind of property, right? It could be, for example, a set which processes olfactory information, even though each individual does different things, right? And this unit of function is something which was extraordinary and unexpected. And you can see over here the progeny of a set of these stem cells after they differentiate into neurons, all going to one large green place, and that's the place where olfactory information, for example, is analyzed. So this is one kind of an example of how, and this is unexpected, how function emerges during development. It's actually deeply programmed in development. A lot of us like to think that our behavioral properties are entirely because of experience, either outside when we experience the world or during development in multiple ways. And both these happen a lot, but there's also this kind of intense programming taking place. But the important point and the beautiful part over here, before I go to the other aspect of this, is how many stem cells you have depends a lot on nutrition. Very beautiful work from the labs of Alex Gould and Andrea Brand have shown that nutrition during larval life determines the proliferation of stem cells and the number of stem cells deciding how many neurons you get. So nutrition during early development, and this seems to be very general, is very important for how many neurons one makes. The stem cell as a unit of function is also seen very beautifully by work by Sonia Sen in the lab, where she showed that you have a group of cells going to certain higher centers in the brain, but when Another group, which actually goes to this green patch in the center where olfactory processing takes place. But when you remove a particular gene, this set becomes like the middle set and functions like the middle set. So again, showing how function is deeply programmed in stem cells. Now, this is a general fact, which is there in lots of stem cells in animals such as fruit flies. It's increasingly being shown in contexts such as mouse and may well be true in much more complicated areas where development takes place as in humans. So you have a group of stem cells shown in different colors, which express a combinate, uh, combinatorial code of factors which make them special. And if you remove these factors, the code switches, or if you misexpress these factors, it switches in another direction. So both loss and gain of function can switch large scale stem cell properties so that, and also switch function of these cells. So, you set aside a cell to become a stem cell, and you do this in a context-dependent manner. There are groups of stem cells. These make a bunch of neurons, and this whole bunch has specific properties, and you've reduced the property of thousands of neurons to the property of this lineage, and therefore the problem is much more tractable, even though it's not yet been solved. <clears throat> Now, we've talked about how you can construct the plumbing of the brain. I haven't yet got into how function takes place in the real world, and I'll try to end with that. But Sherrington famously said in the 1940s that the output of the nervous system is movement. So pretty much everything which we see as our ability as having nervous systems is seen by movement. Another output of the nervous system is actually something which are neuromodulators, as they're called. These are hormones, mood changes, which change the output properties of large sets of nervous system, right? You, you have nice hormones going on, you're very happy, you have bad hormones, you're very angry, and so on and so forth. That's because in the parameter space of a specific set of neurons, you can move functional output from this to that by changing them largely by having uh, different kinds of hormones coming on. Yet, movement is an important quality and sensory perception and movement feed back both during development to the nervous system, as I said nutrition does, and understanding how muscles are made is an important component. And that's something which I won't have time to get into, but briefly to say that our laboratory has also looked at how different kinds of muscles are made. Some muscles, such as these, which are very thin, are made in a special way. 
distinct from other muscles such as the flight muscles of the insect which amplify their stem cells in a manner which I told you some parts of the nervous system like the brain does that is exponentially and again it's the same set of molecules in a muscle context which function to give different sizes of muscle and these then feed back into the function of the nervous system. So this ability is put in place in development and the fly soon after it emerges can do amazing things because this module of muscle, different components of the nervous system, the eye, sensory feedback, all of that gets functionally integrated as soon as the animal emerges and it can actually play in the World Cup as you can see over here right after it's born. Uh, that's a football and this fly can do actually pretty amazing things. right? And it does this because during its metamorphosis it actually is practicing these kinds of things in different modules. Just as in a car plant, you don't test out each and every car, but you test out modules, or you know that you've assembled the modules correctly because of certain standard operating procedures. That's what the fly does. Its nervous system does practice, its motor system does some practice, and these are put together, and then it can manage this. And we know in the leg of the fly, and in the flight muscles of the fly, where every single muscle is, we know where every single neuron which connects to this muscle and activates it, and where it re uh, receives signals. And these kinds of detailed maps of each and every neuron and where its input and outputs are, allows us to understand how all of the plumbing is put in place and guess as to how behavior comes about. A behavior remains, complex behavior remains a major, major challenge. Here's a photograph of Francis Crick, Alan Garan, and Obeid Siddiqui in Hyderabad in 1964. And also at this meeting was Simo Benza. And Simo Benza said, if you want to understand how genes impact on behavior, the best system to study uh, is the undergraduate. Uh, unfortunately, the genetics of undergraduates is not allowed. And therefore, he chose uh, to study fruit flies. And he then inspired people like Obeid Siddiqui to study uh, neurogenetics. And neurogenetics, the approach of making mutants and looking at the effect on the nervous system and behavior, has been incredibly valuable in general in identifying, because of our you know, advances in molecular biology, identifying molecules which are expressed in nerves at very small levels, at synapses, and how they function, and therefore it's been incredibly valuable in understanding the cell biology of the neuron. But it has not been valuable in understanding how behavior comes about. And the problem is this, every molecule identified, even though it's very important, is expressed in every neuron. Yet, when mutated in a certain manner, affects certain neurons and certain kinds of behavior. And this poses a big challenge to the nervous system, those who are studying the nervous system. How is it? that you have regional specialization and complex behavioral outputs. But not only is the toolkit which makes it the same, but pretty much all the kinds of molecules which are expressed in different parts of the brain are the same. So it's really, again, not the gene which tells you how to assemble this, but the cell and cellular connectivity which requires our understanding. And that is an area where extraordinary advances have recently been made. Our understanding of how connectivity happens in the brain is extraordinary now. And our understanding of how physiology takes place both in a natural situation, in disease context, and when we manipulate it is extraordinary. And this has led to a phenomenal description in some smaller accessible circuits of how neural function emerges during development and how it actually takes place. This doesn't answer the question about how higher functions, such as consciousness, emotions, and so on, come about, sentience. And I will end by saying, not giving an opinion, but saying that there are two views. Well, I might hint at my opinion. One view is a dualist view. And if you want to read about it, the person to read about is Christoph Koch and several others of that ilk. Christoph Koch is a professor at now at Seattle, was at Caltech. And basically, this dualist view holds that there's something, some qualia in specific regions of the brain, which makes them special. And therefore, that region has properties which can never be mimicked by 
a supercomputer now, no matter how efficient it is. What that special property is, is something which we need to find out. How that comes about is the quest in biology, but we don't know what that is. The challenge in accepting that viewpoint is, you know, this is like a Cartesian theater where you have someone doing something and then you have to ask what, how did that someone do that, you know, who's watching all of this and organizing it, uh, who put that in place? And that's a problem there. And Christoph Koch and others, they're not unintelligent by any means, have answers to those kinds of questions. The other view is a functionalist view held by, exemplified by Dan Dennett and a few others, and Dan Dennett is one of the most articulate, which holds that really what you have in terms of emergent properties of higher function is a, you know, quick approximation, multiple drafts model where you have regional specialization and learning taking place there, Bayesian learning as it were, you know, some amount of experience telling you what's okay or not, data comes in, stuff goes out, different parts put together, you cross check with reality, there's no one minding the store, right? And there's no point searching for someone who's minding the store. So these are two kinds of models and you know, there are lots of interesting literature about it. And this is an area of very interesting debate, but more interestingly, because of the tools we have are very tractable in a variety of model organisms. One last point, you know, I said how changes in diet from uncooked food to cooked food allowed, presumably, according to some people, the rapid expansion of the number of neurons. And this is a dramatic difference between other apes and us. But within humans, the differences are small depending on nutrition. So it's not to say that more neurons are better in humans or less are better. The range is very small within the Arab. That's one point to keep in mind. But it's important to also keep in mind that malnutrition severely affects stunted growth and severely affects cognitive content, as it were, cognitive capital, as it were. And therefore, having a country in which about 40-ish percent of our population from the zero to five age group is stunted higher than that of sub-Saharan Africa is a slight problem to say the least. And this is something therefore is addressable and should be addressed, but there are very important mechanistic insights from a variety of organisms directly pointing to the impact nutrition has on brain development. There are other studies which point out that despite having poor brain, brain development, there are some components which can be restored later on. So both these are very important challenges for us as a society. So thank you very much. This is the National Center for Biological Sciences of the TIFR. The TIFR has been extraordinary in generously studying science which has no application. Uh, and unless we strongly make a case that this is something which is valuable, uh, and that has to come from within TIFR in a big way, uh, this model is likely to decline. Thank you very much.